Good afternoon, everyone. We're coming to you from AMP 2021. My name is Lyle Branch, and I'm an associate with BD Peripheral Intervention. Today, we're going to be discussing the Rotorex atherectomy system and experiences in treating complex lesions. Joining me this afternoon is Dr. Miguel Montero Baker, Baylor College of Medicine, and Dr. Arthur Lee, the Cardiac and Vascular Institute in Gainesville, Florida. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to be here, Lyle. Thank you very much for having us. Absolutely. So to start us off, um, let's get into like, what are your biggest challenges that you're seeing in uh, peripheral arterial disease? I don't know. Where do you start is the question. I mean, there's right. so many challenges, you know, if you just look outside the procedure itself, I mean, you're talking about, you know, identifying the disease early, you know, making disease awareness, um, getting referred earlier. Um, and then you have the procedure itself, uh, which obviously has a lot of challenges, you know, calcium, thrombus, uh, anatomy, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have, you know, after the procedure, you know, the, the multidisciplinary teamwork, uh, how to improve patient compliance with therapies, uh, office visits, follow up, uh, but also communicating with your team members. And, and Miguel it seems to have a really good system over work, working over at Baylor um, that we all try to, you know, learn him from. Uh, but, and it's, it's, it's interaction with other colleagues too. So we actually are on a thread, in a text thread, through some of the research projects that we do together. And I've learned so much from, you know, the vascular surgery component of things, the wound care that cardiologists don't typically get. So there's just so many challenges in the space. It's, it's still nascent and uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that there's much to add other than, you know, there's the, the patient component, the physician component, and then the disease component. Um, there is a lot of ignorance, unfortunately, in the community about the disease. People don't necessarily recognize it. And unfortunately, a lot of times they think it's sciatica or they think that there may be some skeletal issue. Um, as physicians, you have a lot of different specialties in the mix yep. that uh, unfortunately we don't necessarily talk to each other as well as we should. And then on the disease burden, I think that uh, albeit we've progressed dramatically in the technology we have, I mean, I, I feel that there's still vacuums that, that we have in, in, in very compelling and complex cases where, you, you know, not all options are going to work out for us. So, so it's a, it's a multi-layer uh, problem, and, and hopefully we're putting a little sand here, uh, a little grain of sand to fix it. Absolutely. No, that was great responses. So I know earlier you spoke about, uh, you know, some of the things that you're seeing within those lesions. So could you go into more detail about what it is that you're seeing? Are you seeing mostly calcium? Are you seeing some sort of mixed morphology? Uh, what are you seeing in, in your individual practices? I... I think that it really is a mix of, of a lot of things, right? Um, I mean, I know Art and I get a, a, a gamut of, of patients from, you know, the acute disease, which probably carries a lot more of thrombotic uh, burden, to the more incredibly chronic disease that uh, leads to atheroma, atherosclerosis, and eventually, obviously, calcification of all these lesions. Uh, and then... I've come to realize also as I practice more, and then you let me know what you think, that in a lot of these chronic lesions, we actually find that there is some degree of acute or subacute yeah. component oh, yeah. in, the, in, in, the, in the lesion, especially if you're talking about, let's say, a long CTO. Yeah. You would be surprised how much of a long CTO may not necessarily be all plaque and organized stuff, but sometimes the caps can have some soft stuff. Yeah. And I'm not sure if you've noticed something like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's a lot of calcium, a lot of mixed morphology, a lot of clot, whether it's acute or subacute. And a lot of times you just don't know. It could look calcified, but your wire goes and it, it just travels better than you thought it would. Not like it's totally clot. Um, and we're still, you know, you can IVIS, but you still don't always know for sure. And I'm still learning, like, you know, with, with your help, I recently, fairly recently started using Rotorex, for example. And it's a great device for, you know, mixed morphology, but like a CTO, long CTO, I put it through, go slow. And when I pull it out one run, and I see areas that I have a little channel, but I have areas that are like, you know, like totally evacuated. So to me, that's proof that there's some element of thrombotic-like material that's chewed up and eaten because it's, you know, one run, and it's like, it's like you <laughs> bloomed it, you know? So I still, I think I'm learning still what these, these lesions are made of, really. But yeah, I think it's a, definitely a huge component of thrombus. As a, uh, <clears throat> yeah, as a, a professor, of surgery, uh, you know, I have my trainees all the time. And uh, they'll look at me, they're like, but why, why do you think this one's mixed? And I'm like, you gotta listen to the wire. And, and it is true, because you said it very 
very quickly, but that is a very essential part of this, which is the wire will tell you a lot of times in its consistency and how it, the feedback, the tactile feedback, that there are areas that are softer than others. Yeah. And then the wire may go, and then sometimes it just doesn't want to go, then you know that that may be a little bit more um, organized, but then it kind of slides through again, so you, you already start gauging just with the wire that this may be a very mixed morphology with some soft stuff and some yeah. tougher stuff. Yeah. And that's, I think, honestly, uh, where, where you start immediately going back to your toolbox in your head and say, what would be the more appropriate tool for that specific lesion? Um, and, and, and I think really it's all about personalized care. Okay. You know, not one of these devices that we see here will work on every single lesion, but some lesions definitely work better with some devices. Absolutely. Um, now, you, you mentioned that, you know, the personalized care. So how is the, how is the introduction of Rotorex changed your algorithm? Uh, could you go into more details about that? Well, I'll put my background because I think it's very different from arts yeah. because um, I go back to 2006, I uh, had, was blessed with doing a fellowship in Leipzig and we had Rotorex then. I mean, we're, we're, I don't even want to do the math so I don't feel old, but uh, I used this device pretty much on a daily basis. And it was a huge vacuum when eventually I migrated to the US, uh, get the American Board of Vascular Surgery, and now I don't have a device that fills that. Some devices kinda wanna sorta, but they don't exactly do the same. And so when it hit the market, it was, uh, I mean, it was, it was great because um, I remember picking up the phone and saying, you make sure I have that as soon as possible because it really does uh, uh, give you a, 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 an extra edge in certain, in certain disease burdens. And I'm sure you had a, a different kind of outcome yeah, to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but you know, I used obviously all of the atherectomy devices for the most part, tried them all, and definitely they have strengths in different environments and ease of use and you know, the results you get. Um, it's interesting because in 2012, I think, when I went to Link, I saw this device and I, I went to the booth and I was like, God, you got to get this in the United States. It was really <laughs> impressive, you know, for thrombectomy there. Um, and then nothing, nothing. And then recently got it back and, you know, had the dual indication. And uh, with, I was running a case by you and you're like, use it, just use it. I'm like, all right. So we, we did it in the outpatient setting, an outpatient lab, not even in the hospital, you know, clot filled graft. Um, and it was just so easy and great results, no uh, dyslumbalization. And I think, you know, going back to your previous question, what's one of the biggest challenges is getting everybody to a certain level of playing, you know, of quality. Uh, because I think in the vascular field with different operators from different backgrounds, different, edu you know, experience levels, there's such a variety of quality of care in the procedures. If you can have a device that fills the niche to make things easier and levels the playing field, it, it elevates all patient care. So right now, there are some devices, like you said, that try to do similar, but they don't do, they don't come close to it. This device, you know, since I've used and I've put it through its paces in tough cases, it's just easy, you know? So that's been my experience with Rotorex. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, so what, what would you say were some of the, the, the key features that you really enjoy about Rotorex? I, I like the, the, the versatility uh, of this device. Um, if you go to its engineering inception, it really was focused on, on clot. And obviously, as we progressed the analysis of what was coming out and we figured out that there was plaque removal too, uh, then it kind of found itself in this, in this very cushioned position where it does do uh, a little bit of both, but certainly very efficient uh, on, on the softer plaque. Um, I tend to tell people, listen, with all these device floating, do you really need another one? And it's kind of one of those that you're like, listen, until you use it and, and, you, and you appreciate it, you don't know how much you've been missing it. That's kind of like my take home message, is just give it a shot and let it talk for itself. Um, what you said is very important, like all devices, there's a learning curve and there's specific technical things that we have to know. Right. But once, once you find it, it's gonna niche itself in a, in a very nice way in your practice. Okay. It's certainly not the one, you know, for all, but it's gonna find its niche into your practice, I think, rapidly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I find exactly what you said. Versatility is a huge thing. Um, 
I'm big into ergonomics as well. I mean, I think it's just, you know, you're in a comfortable position, you're not under the camera, hugging, you know, getting radiated a lot of times. Uh, I'm comfortable in most cases not necessarily keeping fluoro on and just running the device and then checking every now and then, so it cuts down radiation dosage for me. Um, but yeah, I think it's very versatile, it's number one. All right, great. Um, so can you go into a little more detail about the mechanism of action uh, with Rotorex? Because it, it, it is distinguishing itself. So could you go into a little more details about, about that? Right, so it pretty much what you have is you have a head that creates, that, 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 that's the one that actually incites initially, and it will fragment and fracture, if you may. And then you have two vents, core vents on the side uh, that are made in a way to where they actually remove very, they shovel in things efficiently. And then you kind of have a corkscrew that just removes things all the way out through a system uh, that ends up in a uh, container bag, if you may. And uh, it's a very simple setup. Uh, you, you put it on the table, and I, I would say that your setup time is probably five minutes at most, once you, your, your tech and your, your team is comfortable with it. And it, it does have two activating modes. You can either use a handheld mode or you can use a pedal. I'm a hand guy. I like how easy it is. I like to control it, and I feel it's hard for me to have a foot on the floor and a foot on the other one and then try to balance myself. So I really like the handheld. But for people that... Uh, like to keep it simple. The pedal can be actually activated by the person next to you. Although I would always advocate, if you do it yourself, you're gonna have a lot of that tactile feeling. And, uh, and when it clutches, you know exactly where it clutched and what clutched it. Uh, and certainly that's something that I'm sure we'll talk about. But, yes. but I think that's yeah. a good summary of what it, how it works. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did I get that right? Yes. Yes, okay. you did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, still, I'm still asking the company, like, I want to see how this thing really works as well as I've seen it work, okay? Um, because we, you know, I'm a trigger guy, too, from, you know, from you teaching me and giving me tips on when I started. So I like the trigger. Um, but this thing just eats up clot. And, you know, I told you, I put in some big graphs and, and didn't have distal normalization. So I still am curious. Cause, and we've had devi other devices that have an Archimedes screw as well. Right. And those did not do what this does at all. You know? Yeah. So I still don't know what the mechanism is. I keep asking, what's the magic? What's the secret? I, I, I think, the <laughs> I think magic, it's the blade from the outside. I think, I think the magic is the two vents. Yeah. Because some of the ones we have are frontal, which if you think about it, the diameter of aspiration becomes very limited. Right. When you go on the sides and create big holes, then you have these massive uh, plow systems that are, uh, you know, kind of r reminds me of like snow plowers in a way, where, where it's just kind of digging in at the same time on both areas uh, at 180 degrees from each other. So I, I think the magic comes there. And then I know in general people are very uncomfortable going up a few French sizes, but this does come in six and eight. <laughs> I would say do not shy away from an eight. If you think that the patient's big enough and their axis is safe enough, the, the eight is gonna be an incredibly efficient machine. Uh, and uh, if you have one of those like big PTFE graphs, mm, yeah. uh, there are seven millimeters, that's a, that's a big hose in somebody's leg. An eight French is gonna give you probably uh, phenomenal, phenomenal results. Yeah, yeah, we just did a case, uh, 8 French, and it was great. It was a, it was a fem tip bypass graft, and uh, two days of TPA, no effect, and I put this thing down. One run, and it was completely clean, so it was really impressive. I agree with you. I think the windows macerating it up is really the, the magic, because if you think about front cutting, you know, like a drill, when you drill into wood, it just clogs it up, and you're not really, you have to wait for that to work its way down, as opposed to really yeah, losing yeah. the aspiration, yeah. <laughs> Whereas when you macerate it, it's like little particles, you know, I think it gets whisked down much faster. And when we cut open the bag, the stuff we get in there is, it's like this stuff that kind of recongeals, you know, but it's clearly been through the grinder, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, I agree with you, that must be where it is. Okay. Yeah, actually one, one little tip that I like is, um, if, you, if you do believe that's, that's so, I actually like to put two milligrams of TPA. Mm. So let's say like you cross the lesion, and I'll drizzle a little bit of TPA coming out. And while I set up the device, mm. five minutes, seven minutes, right, right, right. does what it's got to do, and it'll probably even macerate it a little bit more, yeah. maybe soften it. Yeah, yeah. And then you just come in and do cleaning. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like to, using that. Uh, obviously, that's not part of the IFU of the device, but I think it's something that I've learned throughout the years that sometimes a little bit of TPA goes a lot way with these CTOs. Okay. Absolutely. So, you know, both of you have been using the system. Is there any advice that you would give to new users? 
Yeah, well, I'll, I'll let you uh, <laughs> answer that as a new uh, user. Yeah, so <laughs> I think, um, gosh, the you know, he gave me the advice, and the best <laughs> advice is just use it. You gotta just use it, right? I mean, because there's a lot of devices out there. We sometimes get complacent with what we have uh, and what we have available, but unless you try something new, you know, you're not gonna get the experience. Um, I will tell you that if you can go eight French, obviously it's good, but I've had phenomenal results with most of my cases have been six French. Six. Um, what I'm told by the representatives and seeing other cases is if the iliac bifurcation is very steep, you may want to shy away from that. Uh, you know, I think most of the time the, the sheath straightens it out enough, curves it out enough that I haven't ever had that issue, but that's something to think about. Um, you know, again, relying on people of more experience, uh, staying away from the heavily calcified, you know, coral reef type calcification type lesions. Um, but anything, you know, I love it in CTOs, uh, you know, where there's definitely mixed morphology, probably a significant amount of thrombus. Uh, and I think the, the bottom line is use it, you know, get, get tips from guys like us, the, the representatives, go slow, uh, peck at it, make sure there's constant flow and, and see what you get because I've been super impressed, you know. Yeah, I'll yeah. just compliment that by saying the wire tends to be probably one of the most um, difficult uh, areas to understand, uh, and it comes from how efficient the, the RPMs are. So um, you, you have to imagine that you're just sliding over a rail, uh, and, and my best advice to initial users are, do not mag in too much to where you lose a focus on your wire tip. Uh, if you can always try to keep the wire tip, let's say you just collimate a lot but mag out so you have a, a, a long area of, of interest, uh, then you always know what's happening with the wire. And I tend to have, uh, I tend to focus on the device mobilization and I give the wire responsibility to like one of my trainees, for example. Or we switch if I let them do it because they're learning. Then my job, if I'm next to him, is to have my eyes on that wire. There is some mobility to the wire and the system can certainly, if you get too, too close to the wire, that could be an issue. You don't want that, but you can adapt the wire actively as you're doing the, move, the, the, the movements. And so that's very, very important. Keep an eye on the wire and uh, you should be uh, home free. Yeah, that's a good point. That was one of my questions to you in the very beginning about the wire. Right. What's the best wire management? So in my experience, the wire can start coming back a little bit as you get more distal. Um, so I also use the device and the trigger. So I have my tech, you know, sometimes they hold the wire way back here. I tell them they have to kind of be closer to the device. And as, so it doesn't go forward, but as I'm going, especially if I'm doing a pecking motion, sometimes the wire will start coming back and you see a little slack in the wire and they, they basically have to more actively advance it okay. while you're using the device. Uh, but yeah, watching it on Fluoro is the best yeah. way. Yeah. And you know, we've mentioned uh, using that pecking motion uh, a few times already. Could you go into more details about why it's important for you to uh, go with that motion instead of just going straight through uh, the lesion? So it, 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 I, I think, and I, I, I'm sure that there's probably a more, uh, a more intelligent answer from an engineering standpoint, but I think that you have to let whatever you're breaking up kind of clear uh, the orifices on the side. So you're breaking with the nose, you're suctioning, but then you let it kind of recover. So let's say you're on the, on the proximal part. Uh, you penetrate that, you eat up, you break, and you come back so that there's some flow allowing, like some blood allowing that to actually move through the system and down to the bag. And as that happens, you just slowly move into it, allowing it to kind of quick, quote, recover and, and allow it to move freely. Uh, I mean, I'm not yeah. sure if there's yeah. a more intelligent answer. Yeah, that. I mean, I think the, you know, if you look at the sort of in vitro, uh, you know, fake clot sort of situation, it definitely breaks it up, it's, you know, debris goes around, then you bring it back and you let it breathe and it, it sucks it in. Mm -hmm. I think from a physics standpoint, and I, I'm not sure I completely understand, but I know you need flow. Whenever there's a vacuum, you need flow because mm -hmm. you need a pressure gradient. So if you put it into a completely occlusive environment, there's no more pressure outside, there's no more pressure gradient. So you lose that effective vacuum. So when you pull it back, you, you restore that, you know, pressure gradient and you allow the particles to kind of go down that gradient into the collection right. bag. Right. So I think that's part of I, it. I, it this, this device will, will work for, for a long time. Uh, it'll give you a good lifetime during the case. Uh, sometimes you think you're done with it and then you may resort back to it again. So uh, it is very important that when you do take the device out, you put it on 
you know, normal heparinized saline, you clean it out, mm -hmm. the entire system, until you see a little bit of saline coming out. <laughs> now you know it's ready to go. You don't want that to clot, you don't want that to flow. So I guess it's the same concept, you're trying to clear it, but once it's completely out, you wanna wash it all the way in, and then you can put it on the side, because sometimes if you have a, a distal small emboli, you could go and chase it if you want to. Uh, or you feel like it's in, in, you know, insufficient, you wanna go back in, you can come back in with it, there's no problem. It's just important to, to keep it clear and washed. Okay, no, great advice, gentlemen. Um, and to kind of like finish this off, now, when you talked earlier about there are certain things that you would stay away from uh, with this device, is there, is there anything else besides heavy calcium that you would stay away from? Like, do you feel comfortable uh, tackling uh, most lesions with this device? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So, I, I, I think Art stated it early, uh, heavy calcium is, is probably not gonna be your best friend, especially if you're intraluminal. Um, you know, what we call those coral reefs that you can see and you know that they're, so you know you're gonna be able to float that wire, but uh, you know, the moment you hit it, the system is made to where if, if there's a hard impact, it's gonna clutch. And we really didn't talk about it, but, but the clutch system, it's a defense mechanism of the device. If you strain the device and your RPMs go high, obviously the inner um, system can break. And so mm -hmm. the moment that you clutch, you need to know that that is an area that you don't want to go through again. Now that doesn't mean you can't keep using the device. You can try to daughter the device, meaning push it through a small area of calcification and then restart and finish the entire lesion but you do have to listen to it. Now, if you have coral reef, coral reef, coral reef, coral, you're just gonna clutch your way all the way down. And, and, and quite frankly, there are better devices suited for that. So I would say, just don't, don't tackle that. You know, walk away from it. This is not gonna be your best ally. There's uh, much better suited devices for that. Um, other places that maybe, you know, now you bring it up is places that where you cross and you think you're very subintimal, like mm -hmm. near adventitial. Uh, in those places, the same thing. I, I may not spin into that area. I may try to advance it past it and then use it more distally. Um, and then the other place, which I haven't really had a lot of experience in it, but the reps you know, always tell me just to be careful, is smaller vessels. So yeah. it's mm -hmm. indicated down to three millimeters. Mm -hmm. I'm very comfortable using this in the proximal tibials. Uh, but I think as you get you know, more disease, smaller vessels, that's an area where I've heard you know, to just be careful, but I haven't yeah. had any bad experiences with uh, it, but I haven't really pushed it there a lot yet. A okay. word of additional caution is the offtake of the anterior tibial can be very angulated. And because of the high efficiency, if you catch that angle uh, on, the, on the device, uh, it, it could be an issue. So I would also not advise people to push it into the osteal anterior tibial. Uh, now, if you have like a little booger that you want to chase in the proximal segment, you want to slowly, without activating, pushing it through the angle. And then once you're safely in the anterior tibial, then you can certainly go a little bit down into it, uh, respecting the size, the IFU of the device advices. But it's important that that angle is something you don't want to catch. So uh, do not activate it as you're going through a very acute angle where it can potentially uh, snatch a little bit of the wall there. And you don't want that. Yeah. Absolutely. That's good advice. Well, gentlemen, uh, this was a great talk, a lot of great advice that came from this. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Um, and I'm sure that we will be speaking with you guys uh, very soon on, uh, on more Rotorex topics. So again, I really appreciate that. And thank you all at home for joining.